morning. Welcome to episode 117 of the Driller Newscast, a weekly update on the news and stories impacting the drilling, the construction, the water and geothermal industry. I'm your host, Brock Yorty, and this week in the news, we're going to cover the opinions from the Supreme Court on Texas versus New Mexico over the Rio Grande. Our feature this week is with Debbie New in Vermont talking about can community thermal energy networks. It's going to be a great discussion. And I want us all to start looking at what Vermont's up to, what Massachusetts is up to, New York, Connecticut, what the Northeast is doing. But rural America, when we start thinking about, can we really do community thermal energy networks? Vermont is showing the possibilities of using municipalities and harnessing this great things. I think right now, the upper peninsula of Michigan with line five, which as a drilling fluids guy and a tunneling guy, being on these projects, believe line five can be done without a major environmental impact, though it's going through the Mackinac Straits. I do see the future of the upper peninsula of Michigan harnessing thermal energy networks and getting off the dependence of fuel oil, propane, and natural gas. So it's a balance. I think we need both right now in some areas, but we have a future. And Debbie's going to share some really great insight and what Vermont's up to. But before we jump into all this great news, let's talk some safety. Okay, this is the obligatory we just finished the 4th of July holiday. We just finished Canada Day holiday. We need to get our people recentered. Last week, I said we needed to make sure our people weren't distracted. Now it's time to think we're going to hustle hard to Labor Day. And there's still family vacations that need to be taken. There's lots of things. And let's face it, July and August are our hottest months of the year. And we're seeing... Temperature increases across the country, 3.1 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a big deal. That's where all these extreme storms coming across the Midcon that are happening. We just saw the dam rupture in Minnesota. There's so many pieces going on right now with natural disasters, with extreme weather, with heat and projects we need to continue to progress. So, I want you to take the first six months of the year, incidents that have happened, situations that have happened, take all those near misses. And if you're not recording near misses, you are setting yourselves up for a catastrophic incident that's going to involve injury, equipment damage, and downtime. We work around equipment that rotates and applies pressure and crushes and opens and closes and does all of these things that can get our hands, we can get struck by objects into our eyes, we can get caught in between, we have suspended loads. Start thinking about our policies. Let's start thinking about what we need for our people to operate smarter. I can't stress this enough. We got too many X variables right now with weather to have a standard operating procedure take a shortcut and for an individual to smash a hand, lose a finger, dislocate a shoulder, all the things that we see happen in this industry. Need you to go out, be smart, work smart, and evaluate your drilling operations, your pump operations, your construction operations, and take it to the next level. Go out, be safe. This week in the news, let's talk about the Supreme Court. And we got a lot that we're going to cover in the weeks to come. We got some downtime there in recess now. But one of the last things to come out that has just continued to impact us and really this decision started in March and April is Texas versus New Mexico over the Rio Grande 
And I want you to think about this, everybody, because we've been talking about the Colorado Compact. We've been talking about the, you know, South Basin being able to reduce more acre feet, the upper basin, considering what they need to be able to release. We're seeing all these reports about reservoirs and uh, areas in Utah and other sections of the Colorado Compact having more water and reservoirs than before we saw this dam rupture because of water across the Midcon. We're still fighting water that, let's face it, Colorado is supposed to be passing water down to New Mexico. New Mexico is supposed to be passing water around to Texas. We still have a million and a half acre feet that we need to get to Mexico and all of these agreements. So I want us to talk about the Rio Grande Compact, which was approved by Congress in 1938. The Rio Grande Compact is an interstate agreement that apportions the waters of the Rio Grande River among Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas. The federal compact relies on the Federal Bureau of Reclamation's operations of an irrigation system called the Rio Grande Project. Under this compact, New Mexico must deliver a certain amount of water to Elephant Butte Reservoir, located in southern New Mexico. Then in accordance with the agreement called the Downstreams Contracts, Reclamation releases specified amounts of water from the reservoirs for delivery to two water districts in New Mexico and in Texas. This has been failing for a while, everybody. And we can see this with uh, the new president of Mexico evaluating Mexico City's water usage and how they've moved water away from. So Mexico City was a lake bed and they've spent, uh, since the Spanish developing that city, uh, hundreds of years moving water away. Why am I talking about Mexico City when we're talking New Mexico and Texas? Because it's all interconnected when we start looking at the drought, at the rain. So back in 2013, Texas filed suit in the court against the compacts and the other two signatory states alleging that excess groundwater pumping in New Mexico was depleting supplies of the Rio Grande water bound for Texas. We had the United States and Arizona versus the Navajo Nation, where the Navajo Nation came in and said, we want more access to our sovereign right of the water of the Colorado. And again, I'm talking Colorado and we're supposed to be talking Rio Grande, but I'm getting to it. And the piece we're getting to here is the fact that in that decision, the justices said, New Mexico should be accessing the abundance of readily available, easy to access groundwater. New Mexico is one of our most impacted states when it comes to economy and homes and availability to resources, including water. And Texas is one of our strongest states in the union with having some of the most house seats. Again, we talk about the water stress states of California, Texas, and Florida, and how they have the most house seats. And here we are. So the United States sought to intervene, alleging essentially the same claims as Texas. New Mexico is pumping too much water. They're not giving the water. It should be going to Elephant Butte. In 2018, the court allowed the United States to intervene, holding that the United States has an interest in seeing that water is deposited in the Elephant Butte Reservoir consistent with the compact terms. Bureau of Reclamation works the Colorado River Compact, works many of our compacts around the country. We talked about the st strategic water reserves and what's happening. Interstate water is going to become a big thing, groundwater professionals, and we need to be involved in this legislation and what's happening and getting NGWA involved and our states involved. 
This is huge. So the United States intervenes and states it will allow for the downstream contracts to be met, which have to be fulfilled through this compact's purpose. Now, this is what came as we went into Texas versus New Mexico, including Colorado being in there at the Supreme Court. It was a 5-4 decision in the case that impacts the Rio Grande River water distribution. This story was broke by our very own J.J. Smith, our Washington correspondent for the driller. And these are his words. The Supreme Court nullified a water sharing agreement between Texas and New Mexico because the deal would have denied U.S. interest in how the Rio Grande project is operated. In the case Texas versus New Mexico and Colorado, Texas sued New Mexico on claims that excessive groundwater pumping in New Mexico was depleting supplies of Rio Grande River water that would otherwise be allocated to Texas. So in this sense, New Mexico breached the Rio Grande Compact. The federal government agreed that the New Mexico breach the compact and that New Mexico has harmed U.S. interests on the Rio Grande River. This case was argued in March as we're seeing these decisions come out now. And at the time of the opening arguments, New Mexico argued the U.S. was not party to the interstate agreement between Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas, known as the Rio Grande Compact, and that the special master appointed by the Supreme Court in 2013 had agreed with their process. However, this is where it got dicey. Texas and New Mexico had agreed to a proposed consent degree that would resolve the dispute and codify the methodology for determining each state's allocation of water for the Rio Grande. And I want you to think about that because this is no different than the upper basin and the lower basin of the Colorado Compact and the upper basin saying, wait a minute, we're promised seven and a half million acre feet and the lower, and you got senior water rights holders like California pulling what they need and allocating. And here we are, we can see it on the news. There's places where you can easily cross the Rio Grande right now. And we have watershed issues. And this is impacted by climate change and extreme weather and over pumping and not looking at interstate water rights appropriately. So Chief Justice John Roberts, along with Justice Brown, Sotomayor, Kagan, and Kavanaugh rejected New Mexico's argument that the U.S. was not party to the Rio Grande Compact, with the majority opinion saying, parties who chose to resolve litigation through settlement may not dispose of the claims of a third party. Furthermore, the majority opinion cites a lawsuit in 2013 that mir mirrors the recent case that in 2013, Texas filed suit against Colorado and New Mexico, alleging excessive groundwater pumping in New Mexico was a violation of the compact. We're going to see more of this. And, you know, this just dropped June 21st, 2024, but pay attention to what's going on here and the opinions that were written and we'll get into those next week. But again, sovereign water rights for our indigenous people on top of a water stress state, on top of a big state that has resources that is also water stressed going into Mexico 
We can look at the news right now and we can see the Midcon is having more water stress issues with the Ogallala. And these pieces are all starting to come together. And then you go and you look at DC and they're talking about evaluating groundwater and depletion. And what does it take for re recharge? You look at the GRACE satellites. There's so many pieces of information that are starting to come together. We need to be on top of this. Get to your state associations. Get to the national. Pay attention to what's going on. We have to be in the know. We have to be advocating for our groundwater protection, our groundwater use, and if it's within the state, interstate, or it goes federally. For this week's industry feature, we're heading to Vermont to one of my favorite people in the industry, Debbie, and I'm going to go ahead and let her introduce herself. She's got this awesome background, all these great things that has happened in the industry from multiple states that I just learned about today. And uh, Debbie, go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, tell us what you're up to. Okay, sure. My name is Debbie New, and I coordinate Vermont Community Thermal Networks here in Vermont. It's a relatively new venture to put the idea of thermal energy networks on the table in Vermont. I started out as a teacher, and that led me, when I decided I really needed to work on climate and get out of the classroom, that led me to working on issues around gas leaks and methane emissions. And I worked with some of the people at HEAT and other people who have now moved into geothermal networks and thermal energy networks as well. So when I moved back to my home state of Vermont two years ago, I realized this solution needed to be put on the table here, not just in Massachusetts and New York where it's really taking off. So that's what I've been working on. And so you just uh, shifted the name from Vermont Community Geothermal to what? It, well, it used to be Vermont Community Geothermal Alliance. That's what I landed on first. I chose that name and used the word geothermal because I felt like people needed to know what we were talking about. And they didn't know what a thermal energy network was. I was just learning about that myself. And so geothermal felt more comfortable for me, really, but also for a lot of the people I was talking to. They knew, oh, geothermal is something you could have in your home, right? Or if they knew anything about it and they didn't think, oh, that only happens in Iceland or Yellowstone National Park, right? Um, so I spent a lot of time trying to define geothermal. And by the time people started getting the idea that we're talking about, yes, heat from the ground under our feet, we're also talking about other sources of heat we have locally, we could talk more about that, what that is. They realized that thermal energy networks made a lot more sense than talking about geothermal. And geothermal became the term that was confusing to people. So I was really encouraged by other people to change it to something that conveyed thermal networks. So now we're Vermont Community Thermal Networks. And the community piece of it is really, for me, the most important word in our name. So it's still there. You know in this industry, we take it for granted because we're all working so diligently at getting wide acceptance to ground source geothermal. And I uh, hear Alexis at GTO say things like uh, high temperature, you know, 700 degrees for, you know, thermal. And we're, we're all over the place. Even when we get into heat pumps, sometimes we see this big push for heat pumps and they're not ground source heat pumps. And we're not harnessing the resources we have around us with that heat and uh, tell us what you're doing with these community networks and what is what is the next vision? Sure, well, so I'm always really careful to say air source heat pumps, we need them. They need to be deployed as fast and as far as possible, especially in more rural areas where there isn't the density and proximity to thermal energy resources as there are in our village centers, our town centers, even our small cities are perfect for this. So what we're doing in Vermont is really looking at what we can do locally. We have wastewater, we have waste heat from grocery stores and all sorts of places that are needing to cool things down inside, whether it's spaces or refrigeration and are venting the heat. That heat is just going out into the air right now, but we have 
pretty low tech ways of recapturing that and repurposing it, sending it back into our buildings. So similarly with wastewater, there's a lot of heat that in the water that we warm up and we use when we flush down the drain every day and we've already paid for that heat. So we can recapture that in a number of ways when it's about wastewater and put it back into the buildings and share it between buildings as well. So we have multiple sources of heat locally and we're trying to help people see heat differently. That's often how we start conversations is how do you think about heat? And where do you use heat? And did you know there can also be heat in these other places? And we can capture that and reuse that. And that's where we start seeing we can share a load. And it it's kind of hard sometimes, uh, drillers out there, when we think about a freezer or a ice rink or even ground source geothermal, you know, we're pulling the cold out so that temperature leaving is warm or vice versa when it's the winter time. And that's where the constant temperature of 55 degrees or 50 degrees in the ground, or as we look at a wastewater system and all of this opportunity and energy we've already put into it, we can start balancing these loads out. And it's uh, from a community center that only has evenings and weekends that has all this extra capacity. It just, it opens us up. Absolutely. There's so many ways this could happen. And it's, it's emerging differently in different places in Vermont, having to do with different buildings, different proximity, and different needs that communities have. Because in some places, it's a lot about housing. And that creates more density by building more housing in a town center, because we need walkable communities as well. So that's an opportunity to take a project that's already happening and be able to bring clean energy to it through a thermal utility in a way that can be affordable for everybody. So we're not doing it one building at a time, hopefully. I mean, it's happening that way in some places, but that means that I, as the building owner, would have to be able to afford all of that myself. But if it can be shared infrastructure among several buildings and it can be paid back over a longer period of time, all I need to do is connect to it and pay for my participation in that rather than be responsible for the whole thing, which is overwhelming. And as we see our weather shifting to the last few weeks being, you know, 90s across the country to last winter where we shifted from 55 degree days back to 10 degree days, yeah. having this constant temperature that we can harness and being able to share loads, it, it makes our buildings the community as well. Not We're just not community members where we are really interconnected. Absolutely. And we already are in many places with our water and our wastewater systems. So this is also water and pipes. And it really can be very familiar to people once you point that out. And it can be a local municipal function, or it could be a cooperative in many places. So there are ways we can do this for ourselves. In Vermont, there are a lot of places that are relying on oil and propane. In other words, we don't have a utility that's delivering heat to our homes and businesses. So we kind of need to be able to do this for ourselves and create this shared infrastructure to bring us together, to benefit from the, using the same resources, but maximizing being able to do it together. It all comes down to education. And uh, what I think is really cool is the more we, we share these conversations, the more people can understand from a very local level on how we can vote, we can have discussions, how we can educate. This is to help us become more sustainable, to be more reliable as our grid fluctuates. Uh, these same centers that ask for so much, you know, energy, you know, cause rolling brownouts. And we, we see our energy grid is very taxed, especially with extreme weather. And so we have this piece of the local all the way up and uh, your governor just signed a, a bill. He did, yeah. We presented the this policy in Vermont to allow any municipality, any entity really to implement a thermal energy network. So in some cases, if it's a locally governed entity like a municipality or a cooperative where the voters or the members have a say, they can just go ahead and do it for themselves. If it's a business, it really needs to be regulated by our public utilities commission. So there are a couple of pathways in Vermont, but we have a very simple bill. It's about two pages 
that allows this to happen in Vermont. And that wasn't the case two years ago when we introduced it and um, it passed, I would say pretty easily, there wasn't anyone who opposed it. So it was a it was a really gratifying experience to be able to have support from so many different people. And I know that's how it happened in New York and it's happening in other places too. So it's unifying in that way as well. There are a lot of places in Vermont that are more rural and that there's more of a conservative tradition there and people don't necessarily want to go green or want to pay much attention to the climate and climate change or reducing emissions. Um, but if you talk about economic development and how this can really financially benefit people and make us energy independent by using the heat we already have, those are things that really resonate with people. And it's one way to help people accept this and understand that it's not just about emissions reduction and mitigating climate change. It's about, like you said, resilience, having a diversity of energy sources so we're not relying on one thing. So there's lots of ways that people can understand this and um, really be excited about it. And at the end of the day, extreme weather or climate change, our weather is shifting. The polar ice caps are melting quicker. Our jet stream has shifted. We saw some really bad floods last year in Vermont that uh, really impacted the communities. Yeah, absolutely. And some of the floods impacted our wastewater treatment plants and our water systems. And that means as we rebuild, we have an opportunity to use a wastewater treatment plant differently. Maybe we need to site it differently and that makes it easy to move it closer to buildings where we can use the waste heat from the wastewater. So we, the floods have been highly damaging and have also set us back in terms of being able to make progress on thermal energy networks and being able to have people have capacity, time and attention to devote to moving us forward when we're just trying to rebuild. But we can rebuild differently and that's part of the conversations in Vermont towns about how to take advantage of this moment in order to implement thermal energy networks and other solutions to do things differently and better. And the last big piece, there's lots of jobs. There's so many opportunities right now in Vermont and uh, into the, the Northeast when it comes to water well drillers diversifying into residential or into commercial or into these com community thermal networks to uh, there's more infrastructure to be built. There's uh, heat pumps. There's so many aspects here that interconnect our blue collar world back to the wastewater and the rest of our community. It's it's a no brainer to be in this right now. Absolutely. And the demand for housing means there's so much more demand for water wells. So even our drillers here are maxed out just in terms of water wells. So there is so much need for more drillers, obviously, HVAC installers, it's hard to find them. So there's a lot of work we have to do in workforce development. And there are a lot of Vermonters working on that, thankfully. But we do, we are talking with our tech centers, our technical college here in Vermont about what we can do. And there's so much happening nationally, thanks to you and other people who are developing curriculum and providing Center for Excellence training and really working to develop that. So we look forward to taking advantage of that and participating in that. So the last piece I want to shout out is as you're listening to this newscast and you're thinking about a geothermal association or a community thermal network, you know, you start seeing these things, get involved, go to a meeting. Uh, do you guys host meetings and have discussions about what's happening? We do. We've had some online meetings and webinars and Brock, you participated in one. That was great to talk about geothermal and the opportunities here. Uh, we also host local workshops. So in your community, there are opportunities to get involved and actually start looking around and finding out where you have excess heat that could be used. So absolutely, there's so much to do. There's an abundance of opportunities. Well, I appreciate your time today. And it's awesome to see what Vermont's up to. Thank you. It's really good to talk to you. And also so that other can pe people can hear about it and know that there's a lot that is happening, but also there's a lot we can do for ourselves. Last piece, uh, where can they learn more in Vermont? Sure. We have a website, Vermont Community Thermal Networks is vctn.org. And we've actually developed a lot of resources there. We have a lot of fact sheets. We've got two very 
homemade videos about what we're doing, about our approach here. And there's a lot to learn on the website. So vctn.org. Awesome. Thanks again, Debbie. Thank you so much. See you around. Thank you for joining episode 117 of the Driller Newscast. Thank you, Debbie, who is great catching up and hearing all the great things that are happening in Vermont. And I want you to think about this again, everybody, from state water rights to water compacts to thermal energy networks to how we use waste heat and municipalities. It starts at a local level in the elected officials we vote for that are advocating for us. And it moves from there onto the state level, onto the national level. And this is a big piece as we look at what's happening. Continue to check out thedriller.com. We'll have more great content covering big things coming out of DC and the rest of the country. Let's get our people recentered. We got Quite a bit of work ahead of us before we're going to hit Labor Day. Hopefully I see you at the Jubilee and you get a little bit of a reprieve there. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week.